you start out by wondering when you're going to get out. And then you realize that you're not going to get out. Then you wonder what can you do to try to get out, to, to deal. And then you realize that no matter what you do, you're not getting out of SAG. It was very cold, very empty, just a very sad, dark place. It wasn't enough for me to walk around in. I would feel like I was getting tinier in the cell. It would sometimes feel like I was constantly being, being caved in from it, how small it was. sort of an understanding of, of why I'm there, when I'm gonna get out, is there hope beyond this? Am I still human? You know, do you still value me? Uh, a lot of times uh, we forget about the humanity behind it that, you know, yeah, you committed the crime and yeah, you're, you know, you, maybe you have some behavior problems, you're in solitary confinement, but that doesn't make you any less human than anybody else. Segregation. Isolation, lockdown, the hole. Inmates can find 22 hours per day behind solid metal doors and concrete walls that cut off all communication with the outside world. The United Nations has defined solitary confinement as cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment, a form of torture that causes lasting physical and psychological damage. As the federal government moves to overhaul the use of segregation in Canada, APTN Investigates takes a closer look behind the prison walls. From a former offender looking to change the system from the outside. Solitary confinement is, is, is causing severe psychiatric and psychological damage. And, and, and that's not just something that you read in, in a book. That's something that you actually see. To the correctional officers charged with keeping the peace. People are calling for the abolishment of administrative segregation, but not understanding that it's a tool for us. That's like calling for the abolishment of the local police force. Well, we'll just get rid of them because we don't need them anymore. Well, no, unfortunately, we, we have to have that as well, because uh, when you have violence in your community, those individuals need to be removed off the street. And finally, from the inmates, locked up with no end in sight. These are guys who are trying to kill themselves because they would rather die than remain in segregation. So, if you're asking me the question, is segregation torture, yes, it's torture. I honestly feel like I wasn't given a chance, and uh, looking back at the system, I see a lot of the Indigenous aren't uh, given a chance, so that's, in retrospect, the way, the way I see it now. There's always some mechanism to, to draw me back into the system. I can see that now, but as a youth, you know, you, you, you don't think of these things. You just try to navigate through the system. And yes, I was institutionalized at a very young age. It became normalized to me to go to prison. Ryan Beardy knows all about the pain that comes with isolation. At only 35 years old, he has spent a large part of his life, more than 10 years, behind bars. It was lonely. It was uh, very thought-provoking and, and very, uh, very solitary. You know, very, you're, you're alone. You're, you're there with your thoughts. You have nothing else. You have no outside stimulation. Uh, you, you know, somebody walks by the, the range and, and you hear footsteps and, and that excites you and, and because that's human contact and, and a lot of times there's this uh, controversy between whether or not inmates are given that meaningfully human contact and I'll tell you uh, it's not meaningful. Beardy was serving a five-year sentence at Manitoba's Stony Mountain Institution for assault the first time he was placed in solitary confinement. After the third day I started to recognize my mental state. I started to recognize how it was deteriorating and how it was already playing a, a factor in my emotional state, a factor in, 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 my, in, my, in uh, my thought process. And um, I can't imagine how someone would feel being stuck in there for months, years, 
you know, and, 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 and as much as I think about it, it, it hurts. I, I've spent time with these people, and I'll tell you, when, when I was in Stony Mountain, and, and you go visit somebody in another cell, and, and, and you see cuts all over their arm, and, and you don't ask about it, because you know what it's from. It's from them being in solitary confinement. It's no secret that Indigenous people are overrepresented at all levels of Canada's criminal justice system, and solitary confinement is no different. Indigenous offenders are more likely to be placed in segregation and will stay longer. I'll tell you, I've watched those statistics unfold before my eyes, where you could spend time with somebody for, you know, maybe a couple of years, maybe a year, and um, something happens and they're gone, and you don't see them again. And, and you know they're in a hole somewhere, stuck, and they're not going to get out because there's no hard caps, there's no outside review boards, and if they do come back, they're different. They're mentally different. Canada currently uses two types of solitary confinement, disciplinary and administrative segregation. Disciplinary is what it sounds like. An inmate found guilty of an offense can be placed in confinement for 30 to 45 days as a form of punishment. Administrative segregation is a whole other story. It's generally used for inmates who fear for their safety or who put others' safety at risk. And there is no limit to the amount of time an inmate can spend in isolation. On any given day, there are approximately 360 inmates in administrative segregation across the country. Nearly half are indigenous. Inmates like Timothy Nome. They warehouse inmates in segregation as a form of punishment. And the large majority of inmates in segregation are Aboriginal. Um, and they're fearful of the system. Um, you know, this is uh, the Canadian federal correctional system is the modern day equivalent of the residential school system. Nome has done time in almost every maximum security prison across the country. Nearly half of that spent in segregation. He estimates that altogether he has spent more than 12 years, 4,600 days, in solitary confinement. I've had segregation be used against me as a form of punishment uh, to try to drive me crazy. And uh, on a few occasions, um, I, I went there. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I lost it. Uh, I gone on hunger strikes with the attempt to starve myself to death because they took all anything from my cell that I could use to either hang myself with or uh, cut myself with to die. Um, and I've seen it, uh, I've seen countless men go through it. Noam is currently incarcerated here at Manitoba's Stony Mountain Institution. He was classified a dangerous offender for assaulting a prison guard in 2009 and is serving an indefinite life sentence. He's been in administrative segregation for the last 60 days straight. You know, it's a war zone in here, and segregation is the worst of it. Um, after you've spent 15, 30, 60, 90, 120 days in a room where you don't see nobody, uh, except for a plastic meal tray being handed through your slot twice a day. Uh, you know, you understand. Nobody can understand it until they've been through it. And once you've been through it, it's, it's up there with your worst life experiences. But it's not only federal penitentiaries that have been criticized over the misuse of solitary confinement. Provincial jails and detention centers also use forms of segregation but are not bound by the same federal regulations. One of the most notorious of these institutions is the Ottawa Carleton Detention Center. You learn really fast what you can do and what you can't. Mm -hmm. A saying there is don't knock on the door unless you're dying. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Like unless you're dying, they don't want to, the guards don't want to hear from you. Julie Bellotta is not indigenous, but her son Gianni was. He was born in a segregation cell at the Ottawa jail in 2012. It's like such a nightmare. It's like you go to bed and have a bad dream and you wake up in a nightmare. That's how I can, like, the worst nightmare. And not knowing if, like, your firstborn, your only son, your child isn't going to make it is, like, the scariest thing in the world. 
and um, it was totally out of my hands. And I've never felt so helpless because there's nothing I could do. Gianni died just over one year later from respiratory issues that his mother believes were a direct result of his complicated delivery and segregation. Bellotta ended up suing the province and the correctional facility for failing to provide adequate medical care. The case was settled in 2018. I think there's other ways of dealing with, um, you know, issues in the jail than the first thing being like, let me throw you in solitary confinement. Because what are you really teaching somebody? When we return, the end of solitary confinement or more of the same? In the legislation, we are uh, ending the practice of administrative segregation within, uh, uh, within the uh, correctional system and replacing it uh, with uh, an entirely new approach of structured intervention units. Being locked up like that, you start to feel like you're losing your mind. Your only contact with another human is through a food slot. Days turn into nights, turn into days, and you have no idea if you'll ever get out. If you aren't broken, when they put you in the hole, you're broken when they take you up. That was Bobby Lee Worm speaking at a press conference in 2012. She spent more than three and a half years, over 1,200 days, in solitary confinement. I was classified max security within two months that I hit federal prison. You know, I'm somebody that has never thought of suicide ever and never thought of it since. But when I was in it, yeah, I sure felt it. Indigenous women are the fastest growing prison population in the country. They now account for 40% of all female inmates in federal penitentiaries. They also make up more than half of all solitary confinement placements. Indigenous women often come in with serious histories of trauma and abuse, and those histories work to ensure that women, those women are at placed at higher levels of security. And the irony in that is once they're placed in maximum security or segregation, they have less access, not more, to the supports and services that they need to address those uh, past um, traumas. Savannah Gentile is the Director of Advocacy for the Elizabeth Fry Societies, one of the only national organizations that goes into prisons on a monthly basis to monitor conditions of confinement. Those sorts of conditions cause the very same issues that they presume to address. So the use of segregation is um, a management tool at best that is incredibly harmful. It doesn't address the issues. It only sidebars them for a minute and actually makes them worse. In October of 2018, the federal government introduced Bill C-83, which outlines a new way of dealing with inmates who need to be separated from the general prison population. The legislation comes on the heels of two superior court decisions that found the current uses of solitary confinement violate the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and that isolating inmates for longer than 15 days constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. In the legislation, we are uh, ending the practice of administrative segregation within, uh, uh, within the uh, correctional system and replacing it uh, with uh, an entirely new approach of structured intervention units. Uh, this approach will allow us to uh, maintain those vital levels of safety and security uh, within correctional facilities, uh, the capacity to, uh, to uh, separate uh, offenders from other offenders in order to make sure that, that uh, security and safety are, are properly uh, maintained and that uh, uh, the facility is safe and that the staff are, uh, are safe. Under the proposed changes, inmates will be allowed out of their cells for up to four hours a day, an increase from the current two-hour-a-day minimum. They will also be given more access to programs and health care with external independent oversight. 
but with no hard limits on isolation. Critics argue that changes can actually make it easier for inmates to be segregated, and that the structured intervention units only amount to a rebranding at best. It's a bit of a shell game we're seeing. There's a lot of pressure coming down right now on CSC to deal with this practice of segregation, which is known as being recognized by courts across the country as torturous and inhumane treatment. It's concerning. We have major concerns that those conditions for women won't change. They won't shift. And we know that the proposed new regime, which is structured intervention units, is going to be implemented in the, same ex the exact same infrastructure that exists today. So we've got the same legislative provisions, we've got the same infrastructure, so what's changed except the name? So how far does Bill C-83 actually go towards ending solitary confinement? Does four hours outside of a cell with other inmates and guards amount to meaningful human contact? For Timothy Nome, the answer is simple. I believe that for a person to not become homicidal and distrustful and to not have serious impacts on their mental well-being, right, you have to be around other people, right? And for meaningful contact, that's, you know, a normal day. That's, you know, a minimum of six hours a day being around people. If you're not around people regularly, you, you, you end up becoming insane. In the last 30 years, Noam has seen the worst the criminal justice system has to offer. He currently has five lawsuits and 13 Canadian human rights complaints against the Correctional Service of Canada, all stemming from his treatment in segregation. In terms of the, the proposed changes to the bill, I also submitted that um, inmates actually have access to um, education and not just the lip service being uh, paid to that, right? Uh, under the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, it says that they're supposed to be rehabilitated and supposed to be provided that programming. In actual fact, that's not occurring. And it's going to need a massive influx of funding to make that happen. But it's not only advocates and inmates that are apprehensive of the proposed changes. It's also the guards. Administrative segregation for us is always a last resort. Um, you know, I've been, I've been in the service long enough to know I've worked in segregation units. That's the last thing we want to do. We don't, we don't want to put inmates there, but sometimes we have to for their own protection or the protection of others. Jason Godin is the national president of the Union of Canadian Correctional Officers. He knows firsthand the dangers that come with guarding violent offenders. He spent more than 12 years behind the walls of some of the country's most dangerous institutions. We have to be careful that uh, when third parties are making decisions like it's occurring right now, it's going to be very dangerous. And these are the biggest changes I've seen in 27 years, uh, and they're pretty darn scary. I mean, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, we're heading into a, a zone or an era that's going gonna, gonna to be very difficult. And we don't have to look any further than we're already seeing it in other jurisdictions already. Um, and that's a bit concerning, so we, we want the government to stand up, pay attention to that. Recent court decisions have put a hard cap of 15 days on the amount of time an inmate can spend in segregation. It's a decision that the government is currently appealing, but one that Godin says is already having an impact. Unfortunately, uh, some of the court decisions that are coming out are imposing policy that is quite dangerous. Um, it's, it's no secret we've already seen a, a correlation uh, in the United States and in Ontario where, uh, where the, 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 the reduction in the use of administrative segregation has now resulted in a rise in violent incidents out in the regular population. So that's very concerning uh, for correctional officers. So we're, we're, you know, we're asking the courts, listen, you, know, you have to give us time because now we're having to manage different subpopulations in different ways. The penitentiary system and, and the jail system wasn't necessarily designed to deal with the health problems, to deal with the social problems that it created. So essentially you have an institution that was designed to punish people, to house people. Now we're knowing now that that doesn't solve anything, that doesn't stem recidivism, and that does not solve the social problems that are underlying. So now we have to look at those underlying social problems, which are a lot of times mental health problems. And, and, and you see that time and time and there again, it's neglected.
And it's those underlying social problems that Ryan Beardy hopes to address. After being released from prison in 2017, he began studying political science at the University of Manitoba. We're seeing restorative justice through a limited lens. We all have these lenses, these frames. Today, he uses his story to help advocate for justice reform across the country. I've created a lot of harm. I'll be honest with you. I've created a lot of harm in society, and I'm not proud of it. I have a past, and um, I have to live with that guilt. And, and, and when I changed and I, I turned my life around, I thought, how can I repair it? You know, how can I, I, I repair this harm? Especially in a sense when you're a gang member and a drug dealer, or you're a gang leader, uh, you harm lots of people, not directly, but indirectly. You harm society and your community indirectly. So <laughs> I think essentially that's what I'm doing, is when, when you read about me uh, speaking out or you, you see me presenting somewhere or, or, or trying to address these social issues, trying to end solitary confinement, you know, it, it's all me trying to repair the harms that I did to society. It's, it, it, and that's essentially restorative justice. Ottawa has allocated $448 million to safely implement the new system, which will involve hiring new staff and making adjustments to institutional infrastructure. Bill C-83 is currently before the Senate. I think it's important to continue these conversations because a lot of times they're, uh, you know, they, they make a headline and, and, and then they, they, you feel a tinge in your heart and then that's it, you know, but when are we going to stop, you know, sitting at our, at our desks and looking at these articles and feeling bad about it? And when are we going to start standing up and doing something about it? If the system is having a difficult time finding alternatives to this very harmful and torturous practice, then perhaps we need to look at and interrogate our reliance on that system in the first place. A correctional officer is actually no better than anybody that um, Eventually, offenders are going to make their way back into the community, in fact, over 80% of them. So, believe it or not, um, we have a vested interest to be successful in reintegrating those offenders back into society because we're also living in those communities. you got to remember, these, most of these guys are going to get out, right? And when they get out, we want them being men. We don't want them being animals that this place is so easily turns men into. The modern evolution of the game today came from Mi'kma'ki. I faced racism before, but not at this level. It was too, it's too much.